The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Center for Fostering Success Best Practice Best Fit webinar series. I'm Yvonne Unram and the, the director of the Center for Fostering Success and here to welcome you today. The mission of our center is to improve college graduation and career achievement rates among youth and young adults ages 12 to 25 years old who are aging out of the foster care system. We acknowledge our funders, uh, the Kresge Foundation, the Havermill Foundation, and WMU for making this webinar possible. We are excited to bring you this webinar series called Best Practice, Best Fit, which focuses on providing helping professionals, students, and supportive adults discovery driven solutions related to educational attainment for students from foster care. Uh, the webinar that we have today will focus on questions of how to successfully communicate compassionately, and it is based on research that is conducted by Dr. Timothy Huffman. Um, he completed this research with homeless youth ages 18 to 24. The webinar will discuss the elements of compassionate communication as well as compassionate ruptures. These moments where service providers try to demonstrate care, but the recipient feels slighted, pitied, overparented, or other um, not helpful things. Overall, the goal is to outline a set of strategies that can be used to communicate in an effective and caring way. And also, um, the study literature will be available on our website, as well as the recording of this webinar after the broadcast. So thank you for coming. And I'm actually here with Carrie Ward, graduate assistant extraordinaire, who I acknowledge because of her hard work behind the scenes. And I'm speaking for her today because of her cold. So I'm introducing our very exciting uh, speaker, Dr. Timothy Huffman, who's graduated from the doctoral program from the Hugh Downs School of Human Communication at Arizona State University in 2013. He also received a graduate certificate in nonprofit leadership and management. His undergraduate education included both communication philosophy and additional graduate coursework in theology. As a researcher, Tim studies socially just communication and focuses on topics like altruism and compassion. He takes a participatory action, qualitative approach to research design, and strives to help communities discover creative ways to improve organized action. His dissertation sought to understand and promote compassionate communication in nonprofit organizations serving homeless youth. Tim is currently an assistant professor at Loyola Marymount University. As a professor, he takes a socially engaged experiential learning approach. He teaches broadly in the communication discipline, including classes in relational communication, organizational communication, research methods, and social justice communication. His classes help students put communication theories into practice for profit, nonprofit, community, and student organizations. As an activist, Tim works to help communities flourish and promote social justice. He is particularly committed to issues regarding homelessness and has served as the executive director for Stand Up for Kids Phoenix, an organization that provides outreach to homeless and at-risk youth. He currently holds a research partnership with Skid Row Housing Trust. So without further ado, we welcome Timothy Huffman for today's webinar presentation. Hello. I uh, thank you for the, uh, the introduction. I uh, want to start off by asking um, a question. I want you to imagine a time when in your work you demonstrated compassion. You felt as though uh, you connected to someone and cared about them. So think about a time you demonstrated compassion. Now I want you to think about a time when you demonstrated compassion, but for some reason or another, it wasn't effective. You cared about the other person, but you didn't get a sense that it made any transformative difference. Now third, I want you to think about a time where you really meant well, but it didn't go well. Today we're going to delve into the dynamics of compassionate communication, and we're going to draw on the research that I've done with homeless young adults. Uh, but before that, I it's worth reflecting for a moment on how a study of homeless young adults has anything to do with foster care. 
it really depends on how you want to think about it. Um, you can think about it from the perspective of foster uh, young adults. Uh, the most recent statistic I found is that 37% of youth leaving the foster care system experience an episode of homelessness by the time they're 26, which is kind of a foreboding figure. Um, you can think about it the other way, which is in my own anecdotal experience, roughly 75% of homeless young adults were previously in the foster system. Um, and often when I, when I first started working with homeless young adults, I was struck by how minor or mundane the problems that had brought them to the streets really were and how an ordinary issue like an anger problem or not being responsible enough to call in sick for work um, could make somebody homeless if they didn't have the broader ongoing family structure that um, other folks had. So unfortunately, the relationship between homelessness and uh, fostering adults um, is fairly common. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, work I did in my dissertation. And uh, my dissertation was a community-based participatory action and qualitative research project, which uh, is a little bit of a mouthful, but I'll kind of move, move uh, through those one at a time and um, tell you a little bit about the background of the research. After that, I'll give you some general findings that uh, you can kind of reflect on in your own work. And then uh, we'll talk specifically about how compassionate communication comes out of the things that I found. So the goal of my research was to understand and improve the interaction between staff and the homeless young, homeless young adults in human service agencies. And when I say I did qualitative research, I collected data using both interviews and observations. And so this uh, research is based on 23 interviews um, and a series of field experiences. Uh, when, it's, when I say it's participatory action, it means that I was involved in the organizations while I was doing the research. So I wasn't only collecting data, I was also serving as a volunteer or as a leader or networking. And I have the, <laughs> when I think back at how much work it was, it was roughly 1,500 hours of field work, which was a whole lot of work, uh, but it was uh, really pretty priceless. The theoretical frame that I took was compassionate communication. I tried to understand what was going on there. Um, but often, when folks study compassion, they look at it from the perspective of the providers of compassion. They might go into a hospice and study the nurses. And that's very good. We need to know their perspectives. But I really wanted to focus on the young adults because their perspective helps us know really the positive and the negative outcomes of our communication. Because communication is two-way, after all. So while my research goal was how can we improve human service um, agencies with regard to homeless young adults, um, my research question was how do we, the experience of homeless young adults help us understand compassionate communication. So with that, I want to share just some general feedback that I learned from the, uh, uh, from the research project. if I can get the slide to work. Well, while, uh, while it is working, um, I will uh, uh, keep, keep talking. Um, oh, there it is. I received all kinds of experience, uh, uh, reflections on experiences uh, from the youth that I interviewed. And some of them were extraordinary uh, positive and uplifting. They told stories of um, remarkably compassionate experiences that they've had in nonprofit organizations. Um, how uh, humor and uh, positive stories and uh, uplifting interactions of staff that listened attentively. Unfortunately, there were also stories of profoundly negative interactions uh, that they had um, experienced inside nonprofits of uh, deep insults, uh, becoming very angry, false accusations, uh, being judged. One of the 
interesting things that I learned, though, as I looked at these things, is that there were also helpful and unhelpful things that happened inside these organizations. And so the youth were capable of differentiating between things that made them feel good or feel bad, and things that moved them forward or things that held them back. And interestingly, um, the positive things weren't always helpful and the negative things weren't always unhelpful, although the lion's share fell into those, uh, those associations. There were negative experiences that they had um, that uh, were ultimately helpful. Um, I had a youth say that he really appreciated doubters because he liked disproving them. But then when I went on to say, well, how many doubters to believers do you need? He said, well, what one in 10 doubters is fine by me. So generally, he needed the positive uh, interaction, but he didn't mind um, you know, some negativity and that it actually helped push him forward. Um, Similarly, there were unhelpful interactions that uh, they, they would reflect on that felt good at the time but didn't really move forward. So sometimes they'd have a very positive policy conversation with someone explaining all the reasons something wasn't going to work, but it still wasn't going to work even though they felt good about it. And sometimes they would reflect how their interactions with other clients might have been fun um, but weren't always necessarily helpful. Um, another, uh, the next slide, um, carries, uh, lays out positive communication behaviors and negative communication behaviors. Um, Yvonne, I don't think I have control of the, of the PowerPoint. Sorry, Timothy, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Try it now. How about... There we go. So this is uh, just a rough breakdown of the communication that was positively and negatively received uh, by the young adults. And uh, it's worth sort of looking at in its own right. Um, if you are a service provider and uh, you're looking for a way to improve the way that you interact with folks, uh, this is a, a real easy list uh, drawn from the youth experiences themselves. Um, the stuff that doesn't go over well uh, includes repetitive communication, saying the same thing uh, to every single person who you interact with, uh, a sense of just being there for the paycheck or not uh, demonstrating some kind of passion about your job, folks who during the intake process only stare at the computer or are distracted by the bureaucratic or technical aspects of the uh, interaction and not looking at the client that they're helping and obviously uh, being disrespectful or rude uh, is looked down negatively. Um, meanwhile, the youth uh, reflected positively on smiling, remember names, eye contact, falling up, uh, being willing to go through uh, trials with the other person and noticing when something is wrong. So that kind of serves as the communicative backdrop. Um, I don't know how many of you think of yourselves as communication professionals, but when you are delivering services, uh, it becomes really important to think not only how can I get through uh, the practical or the technical aspects of this job, but how do my interactions with the other person um, really serve as a foundation for uh, transforming uh, you know, uh, the situation and uh, accomplishing the mission, getting folks the help that they need. So with that in mind, I want to move to uh, the conversation of compassion. Uh, while I was interviewing the youth, uh, they identified that there really is a basic interaction uh, between presence and compassion, and that presence indicates care. Um, one of the uh, simplest reflections I heard on this uh, came from a youth named Amber. She said, they keep showing up, don't they, darn it? They come here, they work the here. If they keep showing up, they care, and that's what counts to me, seriously. Uh, or more uh, succinctly uh, says Elliot, they wouldn't be here if they didn't give a shit. Um, it turns out that being present uh, is an important way uh, that we can communicate, that we care to people. And so for a period of time while I was doing my research, I thought, oh, presence equals compassion. However, it seems that that's not always the case. Uh, take, for instance, a reflection of, oh, they were just there for the paycheck or they were being there just to be there, or one youth said they just sat there clicking at their keyboards. And so I started to realize that while present necessary to communicate compassion, it wouldn't necessarily be sufficient. 
And so I looked a little further, and it turns out that um, presence needs one or two additional things in order to communicate compassion. Either um, it uh, requires a thing uh, called immediacy, um, and immediacy uh, simply is um, a way of describing nonverbal communication. It involves making eye contact, uh, gestures that are entrained with the uh, communication of the other. It basically means paying attention, active listening, things like that. Um, and so uh, in one condition, if you're present uh, but not immediate, that's not going to be read as compassionate. However, if you are compassionate um, and uh, you actually take the time to be with the other, um, they're going to think that uh, you care about them. So uh, Tracy says, to me, it's time. You can give me stuff, and that's nice. But if you spend five minutes with me, I'll remember you forever. So immediacy definitely seems to be part of this equation. However, there also seems to be something else going on. Um, we find in CJ uh, another reflection. When I asked him about the most compassionate uh, experience he had or what, how he knew people cared about him in an organization, um, he said this. This data was collected in Phoenix, just as some context. He said, the volunteers stand in a 100-degree kitchen and cook bacon, pancakes, and eggs for two hours. And then maybe another hour later, they go in that same 100-degree kitchen and make lunch. If that's not compassion, then I don't know what is. So when you take these together, uh, we've got um, this idea of making your body about the other, uh, and I call that embodied aboutness. Um, and embodied aboutness uh, requires a couple of things. It requires physical presence, and it requires then also uh, immediacy or an act of service. Um, and that if you want to communicate that you care to people, um, this is uh, more or less the formula that the youth uh, identified. So this uh, connects up with what other people have identified about com uh, compassion. Um, Miller basically argues that there's a three-step process to compassion that involves noticing, connecting, and responding. So you notice uh, a need in the life of the other. You connect to that on some emotional level, and you respond to it um, in some way. Uh, that addresses the need. And so when you take that to be true, when you ask the question, okay, well, where does embodied aboutness fit into this? Um, I, I argue that embodied aboutness is, sort of goes along with every single one of these processes. You can't really notice unless you're actually turned toward the other person and you can see what's going on. Uh, when you make your body in and around the other person, you turn it toward them, uh, you can connect to the needs that they have. And of course, we respond with our bodies. Um, there are other um, folks who conceptualize compassion differently. Way and Tracy uh, take a similar three-parted model, and they say that compassion is the circuitous process of recognizing, relating, and reacting. Um, and in that context, since there's no order, um, embodied aboutness really is uh, just reminding us that, that, that recognizing, relating, and reacting happens inside um, our body. Pay attention to what you're doing with your body when you're taking care. Um, so um, compassion happens inside your body, uh, or uh, if you prefer um, a different uh, uh, gendered model. Um, however, uh, not all of the things that I learned um, from the, uh, the young adults uh, was positive. And uh, there were times when uh, they would talk about all of these powerful demonstrations of compassion, but they would also talk about times where they felt really insulted uh, or not cared for, whatever. Um, so I started to recognize that there were times that uh, the service agencies were really trying to communicate compassion, but that they were failing, and they were failing for a variety of ways. So if we take the four parts in the prior model, um, the idea of presence, recognizing, relating, and reacting, um, I started to notice that there were places where this um, process could go awry, in that the person could try to demonstrate this, but that there could be errors along the way. So I'll kind of go through uh, one at a time and discuss some of these possible ruptures in compassion. So with regard to presence, uh, I say, OK, being presence is a way that you can demonstrate compassion. However, there are times where the presence of your body actually can harm the life of the other. I remember one time that my wife and I were interacting with the youth, and we were talking about subjects, and it started to get um, you know, onto a difficult subject, and he kind of shut down and walked away. And my wife and I didn't really understand why it had happened. And later, 
he went back to my wife and continued the conversation, and it turns out that he had had um, past abuse in his life um, from uh, basically a male provider, and m the presence of my body uh, was very uncomfortable to him. So however much I cared about um, this young man, uh, the presence of my body uh, made it hard for him to receive compassion from me. Uh, similarly, uh, sometimes we occupy roles of intimidation, and the presence of our bodies can be intimidating. Um, I, uh, while working with homeless young adults, uh, worked alongside with a lot of police officers, and there were times that the police officers would get very frustrated, and they'd say, I'm trying to take care of you, and I'd have to sort of explain to them, well, you know, you do um, have a gun, and uh, you, or maybe people like you, may have, you know, arrested them in the middle of the night when they were trespassing, so it's possible that no matter how much you want, your presence is just not going to be uh, seen as compassionate. Along the lines of recognizing, uh, recognizing can be, uh, can rupture in the process of being compassionate. Um, when it comes to noticing um, what is wrong, so when, uh, when you notice that something is wrong for someone, that's the sort of a precursor to compassionate action. You have to see something is wrong before you can help someone. Uh, however, what needs a person actually have is actually subjective. Uh, I had a young man uh, say that he really got, you know, totally uh, his hope broken when he got into a rehabilitation agency and the person sat him down and said, if you don't have God in your life, you're going to die of your drug addiction. And I remember the, the, the young man saying, I want to believe in God, I don't have a problem with God, but I just can't muster the certainty that there really is a God in the world. And I got depressed for a long time thinking that, you know, that this was an essential part of what, um, you know, I needed in order to uh, move forward. So what, what was the director of this organization trying to be compassionate? They were. They were looking in the life of the, the young man and identifying a need that they saw, but ultimately it was a projected need, certainly with regard to uh, care for the homeless. Um, trying to identify uh, what it is that they need is an important part of helping them, but if you're trying to say house someone who isn't interested in living inside a house, um, your behaviors, however compassionate on, uh, they are uh, on your end, aren't likely to uh, be taken kindly on the other end. Um, as we move uh, uh, forward, uh, there are times where uh, we relate to people, where we connect to uh, the emotional life of the, the other, but sometimes uh, hostile emotions, uh, in the case of the person that you're trying to care for, uh, can create a non-compassionate response on um, the, uh, the part of the provider. Um, so sometimes when you're interacting with people and they're very angry and their anger uh, is the thing that you connect with and not necessarily their suffering, um, it can derail your own compassionate response um, such that you have a fear response or a withdrawal response or a complementary anger response um, instead of a compassionate one. And then finally, um, reaction um, or uh, uh, the, the final action that you take based on the compassionate process Sometimes it can be simply ineffective. The things that you say um, cannot be as comforting or as heartwarming as uh, you, know, you think they might be, or the uh, service that you can provide simply isn't enough to ameliorate the suffering of the other. Um, so sometimes our actions are ineffective um, just because they're not enough, but other times our reactions are ineffective because they're based on a prior rupture. So if um, there's a rupture at the, at the level of presence um, and you are evoking a, a, a pain body because of a past trauma that the other person has, it'll make whatever action you try to take not likely to be taken up as compassionate uh, when interpreted by the other. So there's a, a way of thinking about how all of this stuff works. Um, so with this idea that sometimes um, these actions were taken as compassionate by the youth and sometimes these actions were seen as uncompassionate, I went back into my data and I started recognizing that prepositions really helped sort out um, why something was taken uh, to be compassionate or uncompassionate. And that while um, presence, recognizing, relating, and reacting, these are all things that we can do, how we do them with regard to the other really matters. So um, it turns out that with, um, being present with, recognizing with, relating with, and acting with 
um, these uh, sorts of behaviors were most likely to be uh, rated as um, positive or compassionate. Um, and that um, the, the relation of againstness, having presence against, recognizing against, relating against, or acting against, um, even those, those, those might be, you might think that you're being compassionate by pushing on someone. Um, you might need to do that to help them, but they're certainly not going to take it uh, as compassionate. Then in that middle uh, ground, uh, the for region, um, it seemed that uh, having presence for or acting for uh, was taken to be compassionate, um, but certainly recognizing for uh, was taken to be uncompassionate. Then we recognize for someone else when we look at another person's need and give them a need, um, that that's not, uh, not uh, taken up very charmingly. charmingly. Uh, they're not impressed by that. Um, and uh, it's not an effective way of us uh, communicating here. So there is a, uh, another way of thinking about compassionate communicating and organizing um, that has to do with well-being, um, uh, healing, growth, care, and community. And if you're interested in that aspect of uh, the, the research, uh, you can either contact me or uh, read the publication um, that um, fostering success will provide. Uh, but for the sake of time, so we have enough time for questions and I can talk about how this stuff practically works, um, I'm going to skip that for now. Um, and just take up the question, okay, so um, very good, Tim, where do we go from here? Um, so the simple act an answer is practice compassion. Um, each of the kind of elements that we've discussed informs how people can, um, as educators or um, human service um, providers, can more effectively demonstrate compassion to the people that they're taking care of. Um, so with regard to embodied aboutness, um, embodied aboutness can inform our own individual practice um, with a reminder that um, to pay attention to our bodies. Um, so if you turn toward the other, um, and you make eye contact with them, square your shoulders at them, um, use the posture that's engaged um, and in your face, um, you know, show that you're paying attention to the things that they're talking about. It really can go a long way. Now, um, because this was a participatory action project, I am very aware that um, very often we're overworked and underpaid and uh, running around and we have too many clients that we're trying to keep, take care of and there's paperwork everywhere uh, that we have to uh, fill out and there's processes and uh, all of these things make demands on our body. Um, and there are times where I think about those reflections of, oh, they just sat clicking there at their keyboards. I just shake my head because I know that it's not because those people don't care. It's possible they don't. But very often, we're asked to perform administrative tasks um, that really do uh, have a uh, nonverbal impact. And so what I, I generally encourage people is to just try to seem less busy when talking to people. Um, you are busy, and there are a thousand things going on uh, in your head. But sometimes, all it really takes is uh, taking a moment and turning yourself in the chair and looking at the person and having you know, uh, several turns of the conversation where you interact directly with them. Um, and then you know, if you have to keep entering uh, you know, data into your computer, you turn back. Um, I even know as a teacher, there are times when I'm leaving class and I'm talking to someone and I'm trying to do two things at once and you know, I'm erasing uh, you know, at the board and I have to remind myself that right now they're talking to the back of my head. Um, and so usually you know, I, I remind myself, Tim, um, you know, you're not being present and so I turn around um, and I'll have a little bit more of the conversation directly facing them and then if it's a longer conversation, I'll just ask, is it okay if I erase the board while we continue? And of course they say okay. Um, so just try to seem a little less busy when you interact with people. And who knows, it might actually be good for you um, because it might remind you that uh, they're really the reason that you're here at all. And um, you know, sometimes the paperwork really can wait 30 seconds. Um, knowing about embodied aboutness also can inform organizational policy. Um, so if you are capable of reordering the physical space in your environment, um, or you're the kind of person who makes policy decisions, um, 
paying attention to how uh, physical space is structured in the actual organization really matters. Um, so how are the computers arranged? What are the intake processes? Um, what, in what ways are the interactions between um, the educators or um, the clients uh, uh, constructed by the physical space? And if you can organize that space in a way uh, that um, enables eye contact, enables uh, bodies being turned toward, enables uh, communicated presence, um, clients coming through that organization are more likely uh, into to feel uh, like they're cared about. Moving on to potential ruptures, um, I, I find the ruptures conversation fairly sobering uh, reminder that um, things really can go poorly and even though I have the best intentions in my heart and really, really care about a person and really trying to help them, that for really no fault of my own, things can go awry. Um, and that's um, disappointing and sometimes even depressing, um, but knowing some of the ways that it can go awry allows you to tread more, uh, more carefully. Um, and so personally, you can try to learn um, the particularities of the person that you're trying to be with. Um, and institutionally, you can broaden um, you know, your uh, education teams or your staff's um, uh, understanding of things like uh, trauma-informed care or um, you know, the dynamics of paternalism or projecting needs, um, you know, uh, client-based interviewing, um, strategies that really focus on uh, the, the life of the other um, as opposed to just running through you know, a, a system that is supposed to help you know, each, every person. Um, so knowing about those potential ruptures, um, you know, we can train ourselves or we can train our staff in ways um, that really provides uh, a communication-based understanding of why it is some of those things fail. Sometimes it's not that um, you don't care, um, it's that how that person receives care uh, is different than, than how you do. Um, and that takes time, um, and there's a lot of um, individual idiosyncrasies, but as you work with um, the people that you're teaching or helping, um, you can start to pick up on those trends. And um, I'm heartened by the fact that knowing those things allows you to um, you know, more meaningfully interact with the other person. Because at the end of the day, communication is always two-way, and it's not enough to say, oh, I cared for them. Um, you, know, you have to ask, did they feel cared for? Because ultimately, those are the sorts of interactions that have the potential for transformation. So I, uh, I said I wanted enough time for questions, and I think that I have successfully done that. I think we have maybe uh, 15 more minutes. Um, so uh, feel free to type in questions, and I believe the process is that Yvonne will ask them to me. Okay, so thank you. I just want to remind people that you can type in your questions. We will receive them on this end, and, um, and then upon receiving them, we'll share them with Tim to get a response. One question that we'll start off with, this is a clarification on the embodied aboutness with the qualities of presence, uh, recognizing, relating, and reacting. And you had identified that the qualities of with versus against were very important. Right. So how does... There are times when we work with youth um, or our students where confrontation is necessary, calling out someone who might be engaging in behavior that is unhelpful or unhealthy for themselves and their well-being. So how does that fit in the, that structure of with and against and compassion? So the thing that I would say with regard to that is that while compassionate communication is incredibly important, and I happen to think interpersonally transformative. It's not the only thing that we need to communicate. And so there are definitely times where um, you have to hold people accountable um, and you have to, uh, yeah, uh, inter intervention. Um, and it's hard uh, to start a fight compassionately, um, but there are times where you have to say, okay, Maybe compassion isn't the primary thing that I want this person to get out of it. However, e even, in that uh, even in that situation, I might say that trying to frame your intervention or your hostility in a way that the person recognizes is with them 
as opposed to against them, um, you know, is potentially helpful. And so sometimes somebody disappoints us when they fail and we react against it. It's our first, you know, uh, response um, is sort of very vis viscerally and reactive. Uh, reactive. Um, but if we can say, okay, I, I, the reason I'm mad at all is because I share my life with them and I want good things to happen for them. And so kind of returning to that space in our own head and then being able to find a way to construct, um, you know, a, a togetherness, um, you know, can be, you know, can be potentially helpful. So even though, I guess I'm saying that in some situations maybe you have to blend them um, and sometimes you just have to move beyond compassion. Does that answer your question? I, I think so. We have another question. And that question is, how do you adjust for transference and countertransference when communicating compassion? So there are uh, emotions connect. Uh, we cannot not share each other's emotions. Um, and so that's just a thing that happens. Um, and so. <clears throat> In some ways, those sorts of interactions, uh, you know, are, are inevitable. Um, one of the things, though, that you can do uh, is you can identify with the person that you're uh, connecting to um, what it is that you want out of interaction and try to get what it is that they want out of the interaction um, and try to find ways to, uh, you know, make that happen at both board. Okay. And another question, you have presented um, for us today on um, how to communicate compassionately and with embodied aboutness for uh, young people from foster care. Um, but it seems that the, the value of the work goes, extends beyond students from foster care. So could you speak about that? So when you do qualitative research, it's really important to attend to the context that the research was done in. And so whenever people ask me, oh, well, is this applicable elsewhere, I always say, just remember when you're thinking about this, that this was homeless young adults. And as you move from that, um, try to, try to tra transform using your judgment uh, the findings in a way that um, uh, as your context differs. So for instance, I think that presence and embodied aboutness is really important to youth um, and that older people experiencing homelessness, while it might be helpful, it's not as a profound thing. I think that part of it is that, you know, that it is a youth focused finding. Um, so I, I obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, I try to practice this stuff sort of everywhere that I go, I think that compassion is a thing that almost all people yearn to have um, expressed to them. People desire to be cared for. Um, but how that care is communicated, um, you know, as the context uh, varies, you know, uh, try to ask yourself, okay, how, what are the needs of these people and how are they different from what Tim was talking about? And, um, you know, try to take up the question, you know, as uh, that context dictates. And another good question here. Um, so the question really is getting at how do you do a body aboutness when there's no body? <laughs> so the question right. is, uh, what are some suggestions for showing compassion when dealing with students over the phone? So that, that's absolutely uh, one of the uh, challenging things in the, the, the digital age. Uh, there are so many demands on our time and attention. Uh, and there are so many different media that we can be communicating through. Uh, it's very easy to, um, uh, you know, lose a sense that there are people that we're interacting with on the other side. Fortunately, with regard to both the telephone and the internet, um, immediacy can be demonstrated in verbal ways and in written ways. Um, so one of the things that immediacy as an idea provides is that um, responses are quick and appropriate. Um, so you can tell whether or not you're having a real conversation while texting with someone or if they're looking at their phone from time to time, for instance, because if the responses are coming back quickly, it feels more embodied, it feels more conversational. 
And so one of the things I would suggest, if you interact with a lot of students or um, clients over the phone, um, you know, having a good discipline of calling them back quickly, um, you know, can help. Uh, but then even when they're on the phone and they're on the other line, um, you can use immediacy uh, by uh, saying, mm-hmm, or uh, little vocal uh, fillers as they're talking to make it so that they understand that the call hasn't, uh, you know, dropped and that you understand what it is that they're saying. Um, there are ways to demonstrate that, um, you know, digitally. And um, again, just try to think strategically about the medium that you have and, uh, you know, find ways that you can, uh, you know, de demonstrate that. And sometimes just saying, you know, oh, I, you can't see my face right now, but uh, that's, you know, a devastating story. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, sometimes you just need to put into words what, um, you know, they can't see in your body. Another good question. Um, this is someone saying, I agree with a body devoutness, but what do you do when the person turns away from you and refuses to make eye contact? How do you pull them back into the conversation? Yeah, you know, that's a really difficult <laughs> uh, uh, problem. And in some ways, uh, that maybe goes a little beyond the scope of my expertise um, and is maybe potentially a more counseling question. Um, one thing I would say is why have they turned away? Do you have any idea whether or not you've, you know, sort of uh, triggered some kind of, you know, pain body and we've sort of already lost the, you know, notion of compassion um, because of something that's going inside them? Um, so sometimes, you know, pursuing, uh, the, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, that their engagement of your body can uh, be harmful to the other. Um, so, you know, you'd want to be real uh, cautious um, about that. Um, I also have found, it depends on the context again, in my own work I did a lot of outreach and had drop-in center stuff, and so they weren't sitting down in my office. Um, so I could sometimes disengage and say, you know what, why don't we talk about this in a little bit, you think about what I've asked you, or I'll think about what you've asked me, and we'll come back and re, you know, rediscuss. Um, again, uh, not knowing the context of the questions being asked in, it's, it's hard to um, answer that. Um, but sometimes strategic re-engagement um, is a way, um, you know, of making people cared, cared for. Another question, would you say that compassion is a learned behavior and everyone is capable of projecting it, or is compassion something innate? Um, I study communication, and most communication scholars really focus on skills. Um, there are some uh, uh, studies that suggest, say, emotional intelligence, um, you know, is a, a human a trait uh, specific to people. Um, but one of the reasons that I do the kind of work that I do is because I, I think that they are skills, and you can learn how to do them better. Um, obviously. Compassion requires perceptual empathy. It requires being able to look at another person and recognize that they have experiences. And, you know, we know that there are certain kinds of disabilities, for instance, that limit perceptual empathy, right? Um, so I'm not going to say, oh, it's only a skill and has nothing to do with the innate qualities uh, that a person has, um, or it's only learned behavior and has nothing to do, um, you know, with, you know, uh, biology. Um, that being said, um, part of what I've tried to go through today is really laying out specific things that people can do um, and that we get better at. And um, just like any skill, um, you can improve it by paying attention to it, by practicing it systematically, by getting feedback about it. Um, you can get better at communicating compassion. Okay, this question is about cultural differences, especially around body language and eye contact. So the question is um, about aligning cultural competence with compassionate communication. Um, how do those align? Absolutely. So that's another reason it's very important to kind of keep the context of the study in mind when thinking, how do I apply it in my work? This was done in the United States, and um, it was done with uh, the the homeless population of uh, Phoenix, but that's pro predominantly Caucasian. Um, 
there are definitely cultures where eye contact um, across uh, power distances um, is inappropriate. Um, there are uh, cultures where saying that you see the suffering of another person is very embarrassing. Um, and that one of the most compassionate things is ignore that the other person is suffering and pretend like they're okay. Um, so, again, uh, much of this advice is culturally constrained. Um, that being said, um, when, in all of the work that you do, try to pay attention to the lines of culture and how, uh, and how they lay out. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, when uh, dealing with, uh, you know, intercultural situations, um, excuse me, but making an ass out of yourself is going to be inevitable to some degree. The real, the real trick is can you learn from it, right? Can you um, reflect on those experiences and ask for feedback from those people about what succeeded and failed? Um, because yes, absolutely, how we communicate everything uh, is contingent on culture, compassion, no exception. Thank you. We, um, if there are any more questions, um, please type them in. We um, maybe you've been answering a lot of questions, Tim. Does it make you think about anything in additional that you want to comment on or go into more deeply? Um, no, I'm, they're great questions. It's evidence that the people who uh, are uh, on this webinar are doing real work uh, with real people in real contexts and. Um, it, it reminds me just how complicated it is um, and how as, uh, you know, the situation changes or the, you know, the context changes, um, it really changes how we, how we do these things. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, inspiring to me to know that there are so many good people doing good work out there. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, I want to um, let folks know we can, um, we will um, just hang out for a few more minutes so that if there are some additional questions coming up, we would be glad to take them because we do have a little bit of time left in the webinar. And here's so a question, it's a chat. The question, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer it as a question. Um, what can be done in staff trainings or systematically to reduce compassionate, compassion ruptures? So I let me clarify, how, how can you train to reduce ruptures? That's how I understand it. Yeah. Um, when you have a staff, one of the important things that you can do is create feedback loops where staff can really share their experiences with, you know, other people. Um, it's often that we have kind of interpersonal breakthroughs with particular people and that being able to just share about successes and failures, I think, increases the, the judgment that a general staff has. Um, so talking about um, different clients or students, um, but also yeah, sharing successes and failures, I think, is a way um, that a particular organization can um, draw on the existing knowledge resources that, you know, each particular staff has, but for the sake of the whole. Um, that being said, I obviously believe in communication-based training. Um, so if you've got um, a particularly experienced or particularly uh, gifted uh, communicator on your staff, um, giving them an opportunity to kind of work through their practices, um, I think can be, um, you know, really advantageous. Um, and uh, yeah, and then obviously you can always you know bring in folks from the outside uh, who can you know help identify what you know is or isn't uh, going right or wrong. Um, obviously, because I'm a qualitative researcher, I believe in the power of asking. Um, so a lot of times we try to figure out how it is we can help you know some clients or students, um, and I just say have have the courage to ask them what's working, what's not working. Um, you know all of the time we're trying to help you, what are the times where you don't feel helped? Um, and that can kind of lay out your particular minefield, um, you know, with regard to ruptures and compassion, um, and then you can train your staff, you know, with, with their responses. Okay, another training question. We definitely got a rhythm going. So this is someone who is saying that they've been in advising situations 
not realizing that the person has a disability such as Asperger's or ADHD, just as mm -hmm. a couple of examples. And um, this in turn making um, the advisor feel uncomfortable and just wondering uh, what training suggestions you have for that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when a, a question of, you know, the foster care is so multidimensional. There are so many things that are contributing to uh, the dynamics of what's going on um, that you can spend your whole life training um, in all of the different contingencies and all of the different uh, things that people need and all of the different disabilities somebody might have. Um, and you could still not feel like you were <laughs> ready to go to work. Um, that being said, um, trying to identify what the common, you know, the common threads are um, of the sort of uh, challenges that your students um, or your advisees are likely to be experiencing. Um, and uh, like learning what those things are. Um, sometimes, at least for me, I know that when I know that this is a real thing and it exists, um, and I, I'm allowed to be less defensive about it. Um, in an ordinary conversation, if somebody, you know, is uh, brusque with me or uh, is rude to me, I think, oh, they must not like me, and that that makes me feel bad. And one of the things that you know I have to remind myself when I'm working with, um, you know, people whose lives have been really pretty hard, is that oftentimes it's not very much about me at all, and. Um, I don't need to take it overly personal um, that somebody might be hostile or rude to me, um, but that I then need to think, okay, what, what is a complementary response um, to this person's, you know, outburst um, that, uh, you know, is likely to make us able to move forward. Um, but it is a tricky, a tricky situation how, how to respond to people who aren't overtly asking for compassion or are, are actually upsetting the person who wants to be compassionate. Um, it's a, it's a di you know, it's difficult. I, I don't mean to make light of it, but learn, learn what, um, you know, disabilities you're likely to encounter. Um, try not to be defensive and think strategically about how you can respond you know, in ways that moves the, com the conversation forward. Okay, and this is actually going to be our last question, and um, probably not an easy one. <laughs> There's a, so this is someone who's really has worked with homeless youth, um, and through their own observations, are perceiving um, that youth are learning to work the system, um, maybe you know take advantage of, um, and so the question is how to confront. Um, a homeless youth who um, is perceived to be taking advantage of the system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how people use systems is just one of our social problems. Um, because certainly there are folks who are taking advantage of the system all across the board. Um, one of the things I laugh about, uh, I, I promise I'll answer the question, but one of the things I laugh about is how sometimes we celebrate uh, the wealthy who take advantage of the system as being smart about how they're applying for taxes, uh, but then denigrate the poor who take advantage of systems um, as freeloaders. Um, and so one of the things I like to remind myself is that, uh, you know, folks are just trying to get through uh, the day, um, and uh, we, we all look for shortcuts, uh, truth is. Um, that being said, I think that um, this question represents a very real uh, consideration, which is th there, are, there are some people who, um, to the detriment of other people, have learned how to absorb resources out of a system, um, but that don't really put them uh, to good use. Um, and I guess what I would say to that is, um, you know, really try, uh, I, I would think about the relationship that I had with that person, um, and uh, look at, uh, you know, what I knew and didn't know about them, and what I knew and didn't know about their story. Um, and then, uh, for me, I, I usually try to start uh, from a place of inspiration. Um, I would try to, you know, inspire them uh, to use the, the, the resources more, uh, uh, you know, more uh, reasonably or effectively. Um, However, uh, giving failing at that, uh, which I certainly have, uh, we will all fail to inspire um, uh, some people. Um, 
yeah, it can become incredibly difficult when you have to say, no, um, you know, this, uh, this isn't going to continue. And there have been times where in my own work, I've had to kick people out of programs who weren't progressing. Um, I've had to end housing arrangements with people who were um, just kind of like slacking, sliding the whole time. Um, and uh, there have been times where because of, you know, abuse of other clients, I had to cut people off. And I guess um, what I, what the advice that I would give is that try to construct the denial of the service um, in uh, is caring as a, of a way. Um, and when you have to tell someone that they can't use this service anymore because they're taking advantage of it, um, explain to them all of the uh, reasons that you want their life to go well and explain um, how you really care about them and want um, things to, you know, turn out for them, um, but, you know, you can also have the hard conversation of why they can't uh, continue using the resources in the way that they, that they particularly are. Yeah, it's a super difficult, super difficult question, because how much time is enough time? Um, for, for, you know, some of us, it seems, you know, a couple of months to find a job should totally be enough, um, but, uh, you know, in the context of uh, people who really lack a uh, set of either personal or cultural or communicative skills. Yeah, it can be really difficult working through a lot of issues before, you know, people really find their way. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Tim, for a very lively and engaging uh, webinar today and for uh, being willing to show your face <laughs> on camera. And I think you did a great job of actually modeling embodied aboutness, even though you couldn't see any of us and we could see you, but we could definitely feel your energy and excitement and, and just genuine compassion for this work. So thank you for that. For others, um, I want to thank you for attending and just remind you that the best practice, best fit webinar series continues. And so if you want to have information about this or other pre-recorded webinars, you can go to the www.fosteringsuccessmichigan.com website. And also we have, I believe, two more slots um, open this year for research studies that are related to uh, helping foster youth engage in a school education and um, a particularly higher education. If you have a particular study that you think would be appealing to our listeners, please email me directly at my email, yvonne.unra at wmesh.edu is on the screen in front of you. Thank you all for your participation and for your very good questions today. Have a good afternoon.